So, so Colin was talking about Henry VIII started the Church of England because the Catholic Church would not allow him to get divorced and he wanted an heir and his current wife didn't provide one. So he started the Church of England, which didn't, the theology was not that different. Um, but then his daughter, Elizabeth, created the, the Book of Common Prayer because she wanted to unify Catholics and Protestants. So in order to understand our founding fathers, you have to understand how harmful those religious wars were. And they were based on doctrine, like, okay, the Catholics think that the priest literally changes the body, uh, the wafer to the Jesus body and the wine to Jesus blood, right? And uh, Luther thinks, no, Jesus did it once and that's good enough. And so it isn't that anymore. And Wesley thinks it's all symbolic anyway. My dad used to have grape juice and stuff in the, in the refrigerator, right? It wasn't a big deal. Um, and then, and they would argue about doctrine and kill each other over it. And so it was so dysfunctional. So our founders, that's why they separated church and state. Like you can think anything in your church, but do not bring that into political life, especially if it involves any kind of intolerance. If some, any aspect of your religious belief leads you to discriminate against another citizen, that is wrong. And that's absolutely what they did not want to happen. So um, does everybody understand that? That's really important to them. And it's understandable at the time. Um, all right, so. Uh, to kind of go off of what go ahead. Colin was saying, I think he was right in the fact that like group think kit was utilized by churches to begin with. But I think it's still utilized by like those big evangelical churches the most. You know, like where people, uh, it's kind of like a money thing uh, or like the West Baptist, uh, West Baptist Church. Um, but I don't think we necessarily have a need to have a negative view on group think because that's how a lot of like good actions come about is okay. group think. Like uh, in psychology, we talk about group think like he was talking about uh, in cults, but it's also utilized in things like teamwork, like in teams or in like uh, big, uh, like, sorry, I'm a little out of breath. Um, like uh, the uh, political changes we saw in 1960 was a lot to do with group think and how group think shifted from one ideal to another. Okay, well, any kind of team sport, right? Tim, go ahead. Go off what um, she just said. For example, it's harder to like point out a flaw when it's just you, but when somebody else is there, since y'all not having the same like thought process, they could probably point out the flaw that you have on something. Because like obviously sometimes it's good to do stuff alone, but when you're group thinking it, you get a whole bunch of perspectives about something. And then if I could uh, speak on about the pre-class, what kind of um um caught my eye was where they said promises of immortal, immortal salvation or fear of eternal damnation are both illusionary and harmful. I feel like that's I feel like that's true because some some people might oh you can if you join us we'll get you to blah 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 you'll be immortal do this do that but first of all we know that's not true second of all they're trying to paint a picture of them as to seeing them as like some higher power when that's just not true you're trying to paint their trying to paint another picture in their head so i think that's 100 percent true on that shouldn't be any good trying to install fear in somebody about something that's probably not even there Okay, they create false hopes and fears. Yeah. Go ahead, somebody else.
just you can bounce off of what's been said or just bring what it is you wanted to talk about. Um, I know I pointed out in my notes similar things to Ryan about how uh, religion and um, what's it called? like science can work together. And it just made me think about how um, a lot of times like people of faith uh, are labeled as people that don't believe in evolution. But I know like the Catholic Church was monumental in helping push the theory of evolution. And so it's just so like silly to think that you can't believe both things because I know like personally I was raised believing both like they were never uh, neither was ever denied in my head like I was kind of assumed that like evolution happened because of God not separate things and so I just always think about that. Okay. Uh, Aaron? I can't, we can't hear you. What's going on? Oh, uh, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, like I was going to go off of what they were talking about earlier about like the religious aspect of it and like about like intolerance and stuff about like in the society and everything. Like, I mean, you kind of see it like with all the religions pretty much that are talking about like you have to follow our practices or you are not deemed like good enough. And to me, like that's kind of one of like the main principles is why we can't have that, I guess, in our government, because you don't want to force people to do something. I mean, I think that just kind of goes against America in general, as to what you were saying earlier. Okay. Um, all right, so what I'm going to do is summarize the class so far a little bit because there's a pattern there, right? Pretty much everything we've talked about is some idea of spirituality or flourishing or religion or something and some idea of science and social science. And when you come to a liberal arts school, you take all these classes, but the teachers in each class don't necessarily put them together for you. So I feel like my class, that's the purpose of my class, is for you to take your education and start to put the pieces together. And hopefully after you have this class, because it's a 100 level class, and most of the people in it are earlier on in their academic career, you would keep integrating, right? Your co-curricular activities, your academic subjects, so that by the time you graduate, you'll have this complex, holistic uh, framework. And also you'll have a commitment to keep examining it and re-examining it. And that would put you outside of the way the media portrays the polarization, right? It's the opposite of polarization. So it's a way to prevent polarization, but which again is, I think, is a problem that in your lifetime will do a lot of damage to you and your peers. So I, you know, I I just have to emphasize this even more than I've had to in the past because polarization is so extreme. It didn't used to be, you know, I didn't always teach under these circumstances, but uh, I would like you to take it seriously. Um, so let, let's look at, um, oh boy, just a second. I was going to, I wanted to look at the syllabus from the beginning of the class and I got the wrong syllabus here. But what have we covered so far is the question. Um, all right. So Athens, let's remember Athens. It is, it was called humanism, but it's spiritual humanism. And Plato is writing uh, about how they lost their democracy. And when we studied that, 
hopefully you noticed that, geez, there's a lot of stuff that went on in Athens that is going on here. And we could lose our democracy also. So um, that's point number one, is some people consider the Greeks pagans and anti-Christian, but the Western intellectual tradition has integrated the Greco-Roman tradition into Catholic into uh, Christianity, and that was the dominant world view of our founders. It was really there were very the number of Baptists in the world and in the West uh, two hundred years ago was a lot less than there are now. So that is something you know to to think is interesting. The more science and technology we have the more people who go to ch churches that are anti-science. So what is this, right? Think about it, what's going on? And each of you, I hope, will have some theory about why that is, okay? Then we went straight to the juggler, right? What is holiness? And we talked, this is a dialogue between two people. One of them is much more of a literalist, and one of them is reads the texts as stories, metaphors. They're trying to educate you. They're not literally true, but they have a good message. And one of them thinks he's absolutely right, taking his dad to court. And the other one thinks, unless you really knew this, you wouldn't do this. It's too arrogant, right? And it's too disruptive of the social norms. The norm is that you honor your parents, okay? And Euthyphro thinks we have to get back to God, our country. We've been uh, corrupt, so I'm going to make this public statement that I'll even sacrifice my own dad so we get back to God. And Socrates is saying, I don't know. <laughs> I was like, I don't think that's right, the right way to do it. Well, then I just had all those news articles where people in America are very polarized, not only in their religious beliefs, but also in what their beliefs tell them about how to be a citizen. And so, again, they tend to divide along the lines of Christian humanists or Christian um, fundamentalists. So, then we have the apology, Socrates' way of life, holding people accountable. Do you think religious leaders should all be held accountable for what they think? Or just because they have a reputation for being religious or they went to seminary, are you supposed to blindly believe that that is what God wants? Well, the trouble is preachers really disagree. There's 45 or something different kinds of Baptists just in Arkansas because they all disagree. Well, how do you deal with that? Um, but how do you come together as a society, right? Well, the, the key is you need to leave your religion out of it. If you want to come together, you have to think differently when you're thinking like a citizen. And then Crito, Socrates was the one that did respect a government based on the rule of law, because that is as opposed to these absolute leaders who claim to know all sorts of stuff or claim to be acting in the name of God. So Socrates was trying to preserve the democracy. Nobody else, progressive or liberal or conservative, they didn't have any respect for the law. So basically the society fell apart spiritually and intellectually, like the mindset of the people was not, they didn't have citizen consciousness. They didn't have practical wisdom and they didn't care. And they didn't even think they were supposed to. <laughs> and of course the city can't survive if that's true. So the next thing we talked about was what is the substance of Christianity? So I focus on the Sermon on the Mount, purity of heart. And then I have that list of Aristotle's virtues. Like you can have any orthodoxy you want but here are the virtues this is how you should be living 
And Socrates accused the religious leaders of being hypocrites. And Jesus accused the religious leaders of being hypocrites because they said they cared about the God, but they didn't act that way. And so he's telling you, this is how you have to act. And I think those virtues, again, when I teach them, I have you think about how you apply them. There isn't an absolute way to apply them. And whatever triggers your mind is what's going to affect your worldview and your life. So I, I don't want to tell students, I just give them this list. Well, which one stands out to you um, as something that people are hypocrites about? or something that is really fundamental, like if you don't have this quality, forget it, or something that is so controversial and confusing or whatever. Anyway, so we focus on that. And then Socrates and Jesus had those virtues. Um, then in the tippet, all those articles are again, humanistic and spiritual. And Mr. Newland, the biology of the spirit, he said you could believe in God and have this view of the our biology is constantly trying to move toward flourishing. It, we have obstacles, but the doctor's job is just to remove the obstacle because the body naturally wants to seek something greater than itself and take pride in virtue, take pride in treating other people uh, justly, kindly. That's a biological. We're biologically wired for cooperation and beauty. And um, so that can't be either a secular humanism or it can be a religious humanism. Mr. McCullough, revenge and forgiveness. He brings in the social sciences and the sciences. Uh, instinct, revenge is like satisfying a craving. Um, and he argues that, again, we're wired both for revenge and competition and for cooperation. But over time, cooperation works better. So again, you're uniting humanism with social science and science. And it could be religion, but it would have to be a humanistic branch of religion. Then you had stress and depression that it's not just about your body chemistry, and it's not just about therapies to change your chemistry. It's about disconnecting. You're getting disconnected from what you're living for and what, how you want to live for something greater than yourself. And we can't really be happy unless we have something in mind. And when we lose that, it's part of the depression and recovering from a depression has to include that. And then um, Sternberg, part of her stressor was she tried to just explain everything in terms of chemistry and body chemistry. And then she could explain it, you know, stress is when the immune response gets to um, speed up, it just gets on steroids. But the solution is sp a spiritual one. You have to go and connect with nature and the arts and, and re-envision your life in some way that includes beauty and balance and not just scientific research. You're never going to get to a happy life just by more and more research. <laughs> um, and you're never going to understand people if all you do is research on them. Um, Okay, then we had the political virtues. And again, those were learning how to think like a citizen. Now, this is really important for our founding fathers. And I that article, the education of a virtue of an educated citizen, our founders wanted that so badly. You have to be able to picture this, how much they knew if we don't educate the citizens we're gonna lose our democracy because educated people start punching people's buttons <laughs> and then they'll vote for them and they'll take over and they'll use the government to help their family and friends, right? So 
so and and small liberal arts institutions exactly like this one that ex wanted to do exactly what I think I'm trying to do is what they saw as the beginning of a solution to the problem. I mean, first of all, you have to educate a few people and they have to go out and want to educate the, the uneducated. Then you have to have a good K through 12, you know, pre-college educational system. And um, in the virtue of an educated voter, he talks about that, that the founders knew it was important, but the citizens didn't want to pay for it. And so a politician who said, I will, I will tax you to pay for uh, education wouldn't get reelected. So, so, you know, the plan faltered, especially in the South. And um, that's, it's still a huge problem. And the South is still struggling because it got behind. Um, so the problem there in that American Scholar article was that he said, we don't have a common set of virtues. And of course, I think that's outrageous. Of course we do. <laughs> I mean, some people will point out Aristotle was sexist and I think he was also racist. And I don't mention that part of it because something isn't true because Aristotle said it. it Aristotle said it because it's true. And so I deliberately pick out the things that he said that I think are still useful for students. And I do it because I don't know any other document that has it all that systematically laid out. It's very, he, he makes all these distinctions that if we actually think about our lives, we actually get in situations like that. And we actually have to make those distinctions. And so for me, it just really clarifies things. And then when you teach it to students, maybe they can, maybe when they go out in life, they'll go, oh, this is a case of courage, or oh, this is a case of generosity, or this is a case of ambition or honor you know i mean it is part of their life and so then they can set up the issue well what's too much what's too little what's the mean which is i think honestly what you probably usually do anyway i remember when i read Aristotle, so i was like well that's what i do all the time i you know i sort of set out the options and figure out which ones are too extreme and sort of narrow it in and you know that's how we deliberate either in our own minds or with other people. So I really, it's very disappointing to me that he said, we don't have one because that is a major problem right now in our polarization is that the, the, the ideologies, the philosophies people have are so radically different. They can't talk to each other. Um, and, and that is dangerous. So anyway, I'm giving you the tools that I think might help you um, for your sake. And you might think, oh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't forget it. It doesn't matter to me. I mean, I, I know that it's not like I'm, I'm a goddess or something. It's just that because I was, I was trained and I was raised this way and I was given opportunity, I feel like it's my obligation to pass it on to you because I do think it would be helpful. Um, and then the management, how to actually exercise power. And so in a small liberal arts school, you create your own organizations. And so you have Club Carnival. Well, if you think about it, all of those are organizations that, that um, students make the laws, make the policies, they elect their officials, they, they vote on their policies, they um, enforce their policies, and then they take turns ruling and being ruled. So you literally, you truly learn how to govern and in a mini situation in your, in your clubs. Plus students are put on, there's the Student Government Association that works with the faculty. There's the Honor Council, the Social Council. Students are put on search committees. So that whole thing is just learning how 
to govern. Um, all right, and um, Colin wrote a really nice paper about that. Colin, I appreciate that. So I think his paper was the only second paper that I saw so far. I looked a couple hours ago. Well, then we had women's rights. So I, the way this class works is you have Aristotle's virtues, and then you have the way the United Nations, it has a, a more simple view, more simplified view, but it's the same basic approach. We have these capabilities, and some of them are just physical needs, but then we have this desire for practical reason, for developing an idea of the good and having an opportunity to uh, realize that good. Also, um, we need time to rest. And I mean, we need a decent life. We need time for rest and leisure. We need, we need time to establish good relationships with other people. And this is not rugged individualism. This is humanism. In order to be fully human, there is a social and political dimensions to it are absolutely fundamental. And then women have been denied this. And the reason they've been denied is because they were denied full practical reason, okay? So that's the linchpin behind all this stuff, even if you don't recognize it. So now we got to today. So today we're officially reading about the humanist tradition. And our founders were very much in that tradition for obvious reasons. <laughs> It fits with their worry about um, powerful people um, claiming to have do God's will. That's why they were so committed to separating church and state. Separate, and so that was a humanist uh, point of view: is that you separate you when you're working as a citizen, you understand your common humanity. So humanism teaches about your common humanity. And then some of it, some humanists are Christian humanists. But, but a lot of them say, I don't care, like Mr. Um, Newland. Like you can be any religion or no religion. What he focused on was the science, the biology behind humanism, our desire to flourish. So that's the context within which I assigned this reading. And then just for, for next time, we're going to do specific manifestos and then humanist psychology and Christian humanism. Um, and then I also ask you, um, oh yeah, okay. So later on in a couple days, by the end of the week, I'll ask you to go online and find your own favorite humanism, right? And so if you want to be a doctor, there's medical humanism. If you want it, there's African-American humanism. There's so many varieties of it. And then you compare it to the, the tradition. So um, I hope that makes sense to you. And then I do want, um, I'll just take one comment from everybody, a quick, what do they have, lightning round like they have on Jeopardy? Um, so we'll have a lightning round here of any sort of reaction to what I said about humanism. I mean, you can, any, what your first reaction is. Um, okay, Tim. Well, there was a lot you said, I'm not gonna lie. So, um, yeah, there was a lot you said. So if I could remember at least one thing, I, I'm pretty sure you said, um, There's a lot you said. I'm not well, actually, Tim, here's a question. Before you took this class, right, four months ago, had you ever thought about humanism? A little bit, but not to the degree of like this. Okay. Do you think you might expand your worldview to include more about humanism? Yes. Okay, it doesn't mean you're going to identify with it. But you'll just acknowledge that it helps you understand the world better. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Can you? Okay, fine. That's that's good enough. Ryan? 
um kind of what you asked him like did you think about this before the class like yeah I kind of was like thinking what is it I mean I kind of had an idea about it but now that I have like actual evidence of what they literally stand for I actually really gravitate towards it and it has a lot to do with like my world view too but this gives me more inf information about it because like I always believe like what they said is like we believe in um believe in supporting no wait what is it Oh, right here. We cultivate the arts of negotiating and compromise as a means of resolving differences and achieving mutual understanding. Like, I think that's really important. And for me, that's a part of my worldview because I believe in like traveling and like exploring new different cultures, religion, people. And so I feel like that definitely ties into my worldview because if you're going to go into other societies and cultures, like you need to know how to like have disagreements, but like respectful disagreements and also not even having to disagree or agree, but just acknowledging and accepting and learning from what other people believe in. Do you think it's a problem that we have been the world superpower and a huge percentage of our people never travel at all? Like yeah, I think that's definitely, yeah, because people definitely live in their own bubbles in their own world and they don't see anything outside of what they know. And that's all they think the world is. But the world is so huge. I mean, just literally some people live where they, they like, you know, the whole idea, like live to work and all this stuff is like, they literally live to literally survive, <laughs> like live to survive. That's it. Like there's no education, there's no TV, you know, there's no microwave. And so I think that's just so crazy in my opinion, but that's why I always had, had a calling. Like I really want to do like traveling and do, service work in like a third world country that's always been my dream and so maybe after I graduate I might have some time and that's something I definitely want to do in the future. Well there are different kinds of philanthropic organizations um, you know my kids did um, basically just humanistic um, things like the Peace Corps my sister did that but there's lots of them uh, ways to go abroad without, they don't have a religious motivation, right? Other ones are their number one priorities to convert people to your religion. So, so, you know, it is fraught. Again, once again, you get that same issue. Um, okay, thanks. I think in Hawaii, my stereotype is Hawaiians in general are much more open and um, yeah, less, because because it's not that rural. It's not, anyway, the US is huge and a lot of people just really never gotten very far from home. It's amazing. Um, Colin, what do you think? I'm sorry, but what do I think about what again? About humanism, about all the things I've said about humanism. It, I think it's something that can get overlooked sometimes. Like, well, did you come? Did you come to the class already knowing a lot about the tradition? Not necessarily using the word humanism, but kind of some of the ideas that go along with it. I would say. Okay, and and I mean you know, the next question is. Is that a problem? Because do we need to keep this in mind in order to keep our society going since it was a foundation of our society? That's just a, something to think about is that I think our founders would have really cared about this and it's kind of getting lost. Does that make sense, Colin? Yeah, um, actually the other day I was in Yorktown and they had the giant statue for the victory of the Revolutionary War. And it had like some of the original engravement, like engravings on it and all that stuff. But out of everything there, one of the things that stuck out to me was uh, Ben Franklin. He like wrote in French, uh, like a massive memorial to all the, uh, to some of the French soldiers that died. They wrote memorials to the British that died and the Americans that died. And they were all like equally sized. And that was the way that it was supposed to be built in 1781, but it never got built until like 
1880 something. Okay. So it's also true, right, that they were racist and they were sexist. So you just have to keep expanding it. Um, but I, I'm, they would want you to. I can't imagine that they wouldn't want us to keep going and be more inclusive. But it, you know, that's up to you. There are people who don't think so. So, um, Alyssa, what do you think about what I've said about the tradition? Um, I definitely think uh, with what you were saying about Lyon being a small liberal arts um, university, it all like struck a chord with me because I mean, I am going into my senior year, so I've been here for a while and I've taken a handful of your classes. So I know a bit about humanism and I'm just so like grateful for all the experiences going to my liberal arts college gave me because yes, the, um, my hometown and baseball, both rural areas, but I was able to go out of state and through all my classes, I've been able to meet so many people that maybe I don't agree with, but I still, you know, had to be able to work with them and I still saw their point of view. So it just made me think like how grateful I was for my experience to come to Lyon. Yeah, because in your future career, you're definitely going to have to do that, right? Okay, Zane, what do you think? Well, I just want to start off with like before this class, I can honestly say like the thoughts like never came to my head. The thing about like humanism or anything like that, I was really close minded and like just being able to like read all this stuff and like even taking this class, I can say it's really opened my mind about a lot of stuff. Just like even the way I think of like and like really like look into like the world, like our country right now and really see like the similarities of like, you know, how uh, Athens was and stuff like that. Um, I think it's important. I think like, you know, more more people should, you know, think about this stuff. Cause I mean, even me, I was close minded, but now it's like, I'm really starting to think about this stuff. So I do think it's important for people to branch out and start to learn it. You had a really nice post, right? Yeah. I, read, yeah. I really liked your post. Thank you. And I do uh, think it was a leap forward. I do think. You probably didn't come into the class thinking that way, so. Right, no, ma'am, not no, at all. No, was amazing. <laughs> well, I always appreciate that. Yes, That's what college is for. Um, Aaron. You hear me? Yep. Okay, um. Like, I kind of agree with all of them, like, or I'm kind of like the same boat as the rest of them. Like, I didn't really know of humanism kind of really is like the term of humanism. Like, you kind of hear it in like art class and stuff, but like, I never really like understood it in the sense of like a philosophical point of view. And so like, I mean, I think it, to me, I think it's pretty beneficial as well for like thinking in a different way, like, like it just kind of, I don't know, it allows you to kind of, I guess, put yourself or try to put yourself in someone else's shoes and kind of like think from kind of a different perspective, really. Okay, good. And Jordan. Are you there, Jordan? Okay, I guess not. All right. So I did have that series of questions related to the reading. Um, well, okay, let me do a little. I think we covered this last time really briefly, but so John Stuart Mill's argument for women's rights is based on using scientific method to um, anticipate a radically different world, which is crazy because science is supposed to be based on facts. So he's arguing for something nobody's ever seen as a fact, but he's using, you know, it's a, it's a matter of fact that no oppressed person has ever complained about their oppression. They just complain about the particular husband. And it's a fact that the position is based on feeling. And it's a fact that people's feelings contradict the truth. And it's a fact that people are afraid of change. I mean, it's amazing to me how much he can use scientific reasoning, 
methodology to argue for something that's like doesn't exist. And so science doesn't have to be about just the present and the past. The methodology can be applied to the future. Um, so, and I, we covered race, you know, we should, the argument is that we should treat, we should not discriminate on the basis of race. Why is it difficult to prove all this stuff? And the burden of proof should be on people who want inequality because everything else is moving toward equality, right? Modernity and then, so inclusion, right? Being inclusive is a big deal, right? Um, diversity, equity, and inclusion are big deals. Um, so slaves don't really accept it, right? They're just, there's fear. This is all, you know, based on facts, all the social conditioning prevents them from it, but history keeps moving people forward. All right, so I don't wanna go back over that one. I wanna go, I just want to point out that the um, homosexual position is the same. It's the one that's more controversial in our time, but it's the same kind of humanist tradition. And so this is the liberal tradition that's a humanistic move forward to progress. We don't have any evidence that non-binary people with non-binary sexuality are incapable of citizenship. They have all the same virtues uh, and vices as binary people. It's, it's just that they have a different orientation. Why is it difficult to prove habits? So this one, you know, may hit students closer to home. I'm not sure how many students have actually changed their mind and they come to college. I'm not sure because certainly when I started teaching at Lyon, the students were not even out. They were afraid. If they told their parents, they would really get beaten up and disowned and all sorts of stuff. Um, but anyway, gradually they started an organization and they're more for, out, forthright. And again, as Jordan said, I think a lot of students change because they have friends. <laughs> they realize they have these friends that are non-binary and they know these, these people are perfectly fine. You know, they're just like everybody else and they're just as capable of citizenship. So why haven't they spoken out before? Well, they're afraid of getting killed or hurt and as obvious that still happens. They're afraid to complain. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to point out that that is a part of the humanist tradition and the humanist tradition is always applying reason uh, science and social science to um, current issues that are controversial. And they're always testing the boundaries. Remember John Stuart Mill said, it's the responsibility of the educated people to see the future of the species, to, to create a vision going forward and to convince people they shouldn't be afraid, but they need to break out of their habits because they're, it's based on a lie. Um, so, so it's not, it doesn't advocate revolution, but it advocates constant adaptation because things are always changing. So the humanist tradition would say, based on humanist principles, move forward, adapt, do what is appropriate right now. Um, okay, so let's go through this. And I have a number of talking points. And then I will do a couple lightning rounds, right? I will, I think there's nine talking points and I'll do two or three lightning rounds, which means while I'm going through the outline, think about what you wanna say, okay? And I'll just hold your feet to the fire for uh, a minute or two. Is this true that philosophy is important, that everyone has one? Um, and it's this desire to express the need to find significance and meaning in life um, and to integrate our lives. So for me, this explains every nutcake position you've ever heard, like QAnon. It's because there's a need to find significance and meaning. 
there's a need to think of yourself as a hero who's saving the world from evil. Um, and so people will believe just about anything to satisfy that need. Um, but that's why, because it's such a deep-seated need, it's so important for you to link science, social science, and humanities, and to come with a really balanced point of view, an accurate point of view, and a point of view that will actually lead you and your country forward. Um, all right, it's not just a theory, it's a way of life. Uh, Jesus and Socrates, these are, this is standard tropes now. Jesus was the martyr in religion, Socrates in philosophy, but they had the same virtues and ran into the same problems. Okay, the USA had a humanistic origin and tradition. John Thomas Jefferson, right, was a great humanist. He was a Unitarian and he's against monkish ignorance. So that was, it was mostly Catholic monks who were kind of the icons and they were the educators of the elite. So elite people went to Catholic universities um, and he really wants to break away from that, right? He wants people to think for themselves. He doesn't want you to think the priest has a hotline to God, so, but you've got to educate people, okay? We believe in people, we're giving them this opportunity, now they have to get educated. Just like in Athens, right? Athens had to set up all these institutions and all these opportunities and all these rituals, get people to think like a citizen. Um, Jefferson was also racist. He didn't free his slaves when he died, which is the worst, just such a shocking thing, but he had a lot of flaws. Um, but he laid out this ideology and we can work with it. So just, he said it, but he didn't live it, but we can move forward and live it, okay? Uh, Abraham Lincoln, the preamble to the constitution. This is really important because right now, the Supreme Court is making all these decisions about what laws that have been passed in the past were violated the constitution or not. And, um, the issue there is whether the laws, well, yeah. And so it is important to get the preamble to the constitution. Geez, I can't find what page it's on, but it doesn't include God, which is really, that was very radical at the time to have a constitution that didn't refer to God. And it says that it's the duty of the legislators to take care of the national, basically, uh, well-being, the welfare of the subjects. And that's why, um, that's how you can have public education and you can have uh, health care, which our founders didn't have, right? They didn't have public funded. Well, they didn't, certainly didn't have health care. They, I mean, originally they didn't have public education. They tried to instigate it, right? It was, it was minimal government. You have to justify education, paying taxes for education. And that would be the well-being of the people, the public welfare. So it isn't just the law, legal system is not just about military and police. It's not just about security. Uh, it's also about promoting well-being. Um, all right. Okay, so radical point, they didn't mention God. Third point is there were different kinds of humanism. Uh, Renaissance humanism. Okay, they were, so um, medieval Christianity had gotten stuck into an orthodoxy. And there was this one and only one way to look at the world. And they were very, they became very intolerant. It's very ironic because originally when the Catholic Church has Aristotle in it, but they co-opted Aristotle and made him into there's one and only one answer, which is not Aristotle at all. Originally, it was a lot more open-minded and it was very radical. It's like the conservatives did not want Aristotle 
in their orthodoxy because he's a pagan. <laughs> but and he but he was also and he was a scientist, but it got incorporated. So that's why, as Alyssa says, the Catholic Church incorporated evolution. And I think it was right around the time I was in high school because there was a priest named Tyre de Chardin who unearthed the oldest human skeleton or something. And so, and that was also true during the Middle Ages, some of the best scientific work. As a matter of fact, I think the vast majority of the best scientific work was done by monks in monasteries because they were educated and they had leisure time. And so science was not split from religion. It's just that when the modern era happened, then the church was threatened by the change. And then there was this split, right? Uh, political split, economic split. And so it was made into a theoretical split, but it didn't really have to be, and it shouldn't have been, but it was. So, okay. Um, all right. So the humanists rejected the authority of the Catholic Church. Um, and they, um, and so then they returned to the Greek and Roman cl classics, and that's what they refer to as humanism, the Renaissance humanists. Um, then eventually they kept clinging to Aristotle's science and they rejected modern science. So then modern humanism went in a different direction. Um, okay. But our founding fathers wanted to maintain Aristotle's virtues and yet have a modern view of humanism. So that, and we'll see that when we look at Confucius, then our founders embraced Confucius Analects, but they also started these ethical, ethical societies. They really wanted to cultivate groups of people that met together to talk about the virtues without talking about their religion, because they really wanted to cultivate this. Um, all right, I think next time we're gonna talk about the manifestos and how things have changed over time. Um, so next time we'll talk about these manifestos and we'll talk about the, de the United Nations Declaration, that's just a summary, um, and the United Nations Capabilities Approach, which we've already looked at. Um, okay, and then Aristotle's virtues and how they all fit together. So um, your reactions to the reading when it talks about how our founding fathers were humanists. Um, all right. Let's see. Okay, Tim, what were you told about the founding fathers? Well, well I mean, I didn't really know much before, but I had wrote down why well, I wrote down while you was going on that kind of like got to me how the preamble and the constitution leave out mention of God. I don't see why they would do that because it all every, most things tie back to him, him or however everybody sees it. So I guess they try to um, make things more like literal in a sense to where you don't have to believe in a certain thing to um, govern something. Right, they wanna separate your citizen consciousness yes. from your religious consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Now, does that make sense to you why they did that? Uh, yes, because um, if, if say if I don't believe in it, but you do, it shouldn't change anything. It's still what it is. You shouldn't discriminate against somebody, yes. right? You shouldn't refuse to give somebody a job mm -hmm. or or rent or you know sell them a house or 
all these other things that are necessary for people to have a decent life. And if you discriminate against people based on these false divisions, you're going to lose your democracy, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, Ryan, what do you think about what you read about the founders being humanist? Um, well, I mean, I think just the idea that they wanted to, well, they like just the history of where they came from. So they were super pressed in terms of like religion. And so they wanted to make sure that didn't happen again. So they wanted to give a lot of freedom to people, which I feel like aligns with humanism. So I feel like they did definitely try to hit the core idea of just like freedom and um, allowing people to choose what they want to do and what they want to believe in. Is that what you learn in high school? Like just that idea of like humanism? Yeah. Um, mm, not really in high school, to be honest. I mean, well, I took like, there was one philosophy class, like religion and philosophy, actually. So it was like combined. Um, yeah, but there was just one class. Other than that, there, there wasn't. I just took a lot of speech classes. We didn't really have that kind of classes. Well, what did you learn in the class? Did you learn something that was really helpful to being a democratic citizen? Um, we just kind of learned about, uh, or we just talked about like certain issues that was happening. Uh, I mean, the class was like a really long time ago, so I can't remember oh, okay. like all the details. It was during high school. I mean, I'm an upcoming freshman, so it wasn't too long ago, but um, I mean, it was just the idea of like respecting other people's opinions. And like in a lot of classes, especially in high school, it's like, you're in these classes where it's like right or wrong, right? Like the, you have the answer and it's either right or wrong. But when it comes to philosophy and kind of ideologies and what people believe in, like there's, I mean, there's a right or wrong, but there really kind of isn't because people like minds are beautiful in the sense where they can take, look at one thing and it can translate into like 50 other things. And so we kind of just learned about respecting other people's opinions. Okay. The next issue is, do you need to really think clearly about having an educated opinion? I'll just, I, you know, that would be the next question to think about is, again, my students will say, oh, Dr. Beck's class, she just wants your opinion. It's not very serious. And I think, no, no, these issues about political things are the hardest things to think about. You know, like taking a test and memorize something is a piece of cake compared to trying to figure out what sort of education policy we want to have, right? Yeah, it's hard. Um, okay, so let me read the preamble to the Constitution. Uh, we, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this constitution. So, I and also the Bill of Rights doesn't mention the deity. Okay, so that would be your responsibility as a citizen is to figure out how to make laws or to hold your legislators accountable to make laws that aren't just military the common defense, obviously, but also promoting the general welfare, right? And, and securing, enable, enabling people to be free, but um, ensuring domestic tranquility. I suppose that's how you get the police, justifying the police, keep the peace. But there's also that general welfare clause. And that's where gets called socialism, where you make, you, you tax and spend on programs that promote a middle class. Because if you don't interfere in the market, the rich will get richer and the poor will get more poorer and it won't promote the general welfare. Um, so that was the point I wanted to make there. But um, Colin, what do you think about the fact that our founders were raving humanists. 
Um, I think it's kind of funny in an idea because um, some of them did hinder other people from living their best life within America and some of their some of the issues that were ran upon in the upcoming years which granted under a hundred years there's a whole civil war could have been maybe avoided or slowed a lot if- there were a lot of people who did not want the institution of slavery to be approved. But there were people who said, I'm not going to vote for this unless you allow it. And so that was the problem. It was going to be slavery or nothing. And yeah, I mean, I think those people knew this is going to be a ball and chain on our country forever, which I think it has been. Um, And, you know, yeah, so but some of them were, they just they were blind. So it is important to read history. Smart people were blind to certain things that everybody can see now. So that's why when you're studying this, you can think, well, what is it that I'm blind to? What is it I'm getting conditioning? And I can't see something that 50 years from now will be so obvious, right? Does that make sense, Colin? Okay. And, you know, you can think, I mean, I'm interested in the, you know, because you're so focused on STEM, you can think about what is it that STEM enables you to see and what is it that STEM blinds you to because you don't think about it very much, right? And that's just an open question, but that I'm honestly curious about your thoughts on that as we proceed. Um, Zane, what do you think? Um, I kind of like the humanism thing and uh, just kind of thinking about it. I think it all boils down to like kind of like what we've been saying. And it ties into a lot of stuff that we've been saying in this class, actually, which is balance. And that's like especially uh, whenever, you know, they left out, you know, uh, the religion and like, you know, forcing that from, you know, uh, Great Britain and stuff like that. Um, I think that's just like balancing that out. And so and kind of like you don't want to go too extreme on one side of the other or, or the other. And that's like kind of where. They said, like, you know, not going too extreme or too little. You know, that's where flourishment happens. And I think that was a big ideology in a lot of the stuff. Okay, good. Alyssa? Um, it all honestly reminds me to something Dr. Gitz said in our my first ever class with him about how the founding fathers, it, this may not be the direct quote, but it was similar how the founding fathers were geniuses creating a system for idiots and how they wanted as many people to be able to participate, granted that did leave out people of color and women, but they wanted as many people to be able to participate in their government government as possible. And at the same time, they knew they weren't perfect because they left the constitution open-ended. Like they said, how our rights are not limited to the constitution. So it, it just like kind of reminded me of that, of how like, yes, they were geniuses, but they knew they didn't have the answers to everything at that very moment. Yeah, okay, good. But they did want people to have a mindset, right? They knew that unless you have this mindset, you're not gonna make good judgments about moving forward. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, Aaron. Hello. Hello. Okay. Um, I mean, I think I think it's very interesting that they were humanists. I mean, I think it reflects and kind of they did want to like start like a new chapter and everything. They wanted to be like an open society that was inviting. However, they did have their issues and flaws, as other people have noted. So, I mean, I think like overall, like like they did the best I feel like they could at the time. Cause like, we don't know how really to, how we would think if we were living in that time really. So, but I mean, I think they did a good, like, I think it was like a good, I guess, basis for the country to kind of evolve from. And I think that's kind of how they made it to evolve. I mean, there's plenty of them might, might've thought women should be treated as equals, 
but they knew if they mentioned it, they'd never get elected or nobody would approve of the constitution, right? You have to, yeah, you had to pass the constitution with votes. <laughs> I mean, people had to buy into it. And so there might have been a lot of things that you thought were true that you knew was never going to make it in this round. And that is why it would be adaptable. Um, and that's another, you never get to read that in history because nobody's going to say it publicly who wanted to get the constitution passed, <laughs> right? They just keep it to themselves. Um, and that, that still happens today, I'm sure. Um, Jordan, do you have one comment about our founders being raving humanists? I think that they were as human as they could be for the time period, because I think that they still kind of viewed people as a means to the end. Okay. Uh, like a means of production uh, for like, even though Jefferson advocated for the release of slaves, he didn't release his own slaves, you know, that kind of thing. Right. Um, all right. So the other point I want to keep emphasizing is that people have this need to find significance and meaning in life and to have an integrated worldview. And um, there's just a lot of people in the United States who meet that need with a worldview that is anti-humanistic. Does that make sense? And it, it's a problem uh, because we can't have a democracy unless we do, when we're thinking like citizens, we study our common humanity. We study it. We study the biology behind it, the social science, the humanities. What happens when countries are polarized? How does that affect them? Anyway, and this is a, this is a quote from um, 2002 about, and it doesn't, you know, the point is that Mr. Suskind wrote an article about one of the people in the White House staff, and they didn't like it, so they called him in. And um, he said, um, he said, people like me are in what we call the reality-based community, which he defined as people who believe solutions emerge from your judicious study of discernible reality. I mumbled and murmured something about the enlightenment, right? The enlightenment is you're based on facts and empiricism. He cut me off. That's not the way the world works anymore. We're an empire now. And when we act, we create our own reality. And while you're studying that reality, judiciously, as you will, we'll act again, creating other new realities, which you can study. And that's how things will sort out where history's actors and all of you guys will be left just to study what we do. All right, do you think that this attitude that we're gonna just use words to create all these counter realities for the purposes of gaining and maintaining power is a problem in our country now, even bigger problem. Anybody want to speak to that? Oh uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I just think it's a big like a big deal whenever they're just doing this to control power. I mean, I don't think that's ever what the system was meant to be, just to you know create all these different realities and kind of just kind of showing their authorities like, yeah, we're going to do this, and you're just going to. You're just going to study it and see what we do and stuff like that. I don't think the system was ever or, you know, a correct system was ever meant to be that way. I mean, I think it should be kind of, you know, obviously for the people and obviously making the right compromises and stuff like that for the well-being of the people that they got authority over, not just kind of show, showing power and just saying like, yeah, we're going to do this and you're just going to study it and stuff like that. So when you put people on juries and you put them voting, voting, what you're asking them to do is to think about facts and arguments, right? And politicians are supposed to talk about practical wisdom. Right. And why, yeah, and it's not happening. Just right. like, yeah, just like in Athens, remember the teachers of persuasion taught the 
the best and the brightest how to how to appear to be good so then they could win their case right yeah okay zane <laughs> everybody else kind of get it not this again but it's very dangerous right that's how athens lost its its people so that just a heads up for next time um what we are going to talk about is humanism and anti-humanism um there is a anti-humanist movement so okay let's see i want you to read the manifestos let me see if they're yeah so here are the humanist manifestos and then there's a, a critique of these manifestos right it's raving right um okay and this um this person truly disagrees and gives you let's see uh yeah so i think this is a major source of the polarization in our country and yeah uh okay so the religious leader pat robertson you say you're supposed to be nice to the episcopalians the presbyterians and methodists those are the ones that unite reason and faith and he's calling them the antichrist <laughs> but those were our founding fathers all right okay um the huckabee values the conflict uh the conflict on all sorts of policy issues which has just gotten even more profound pronounced but i hope i mean you should take time on this because this is the kind of stuff at the end of the day people will talk to each other about i think i mean it's very hard to figure out because i don't know how much people just go on social media and whatever they heard you know in the last few days but at the root there is this terrible problem there are anti-humanist so the puritanical tradition is that human beings are by nature scumbags and worms and sinners and rotten and they have to have salvation but you can't base a democracy on that right if you the whole premise of democracy is to be humanistic you have to believe in people you have to believe that they can think like citizens now maybe they have to go to church and pray like sermon on the mount and purify their hearts before they go to the courthouse or go to their jobs so maybe they you know their faith puts them in the right frame of mind but when they get to the citizen into the public realm they have to treat each other as equals they have to listen and they really have to think about our common humanity and if we can't do that we're not going to have a democracy because democracy depends on that um does everybody understand that we have seven minutes any other comments um okay so then the next thing would be getting your assignments in uh, a lot of people are pretty far behind and also i keep saying this but i am absolutely going to have to start filling out the attendance record so let me make sure i've got it right Alyssa, did you miss oh ryan Oh, sorry, I was just gonna um, reconfirm. We have one paper that we don't have to do, right? So that could have been for this past paper, but then the rest we have to turn in. Yeah, so there, there are four papers and then a final paper because the class goes over five weeks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Skip you can one. just, I originally said one paper each week and then the final paper, but now it's just three so you can skip one i wouldn't advise it early on but if if that's your judgment that's fine okay um, but we turn it in late though so like let's say for example we have we we turn it in by 
the end of this week or something like would you still take that with credit or would you just yeah no I don't I don't care that much if you turn in late it's just that boy you get way behind if okay. you do but I don't care because of how condensed the class is the other thing I do want you to write down is when you're doing your post say how many hours you took either reading the material going to the videos and writing because I do want you to be reading the material and not just faking it you know so so just let me know how much time and you have to remember you owe me a lot of time I'm not going to take that much of your time but you owe me two hours per hour of class right so that's like seven and a half hours um total and that's a lot I understand but anyway so Alyssa I have one and a half days that you missed is that true is that uh yes ma'am I think so okay. Colin zero Ryan zero Michael let me know he was sick today Alexis is not here um Tim you've been here every time bravo um Zane you've been here every time is that true tell me if it's not true yeah I've been here every day Tim have you been here every day yep good for you Aaron I have I don't know I've lost track six absences is that right that sounds about right yeah okay well that's well over the the max so you have to like you've got to start showing me that you're doing this or i've got to just drop you okay and then jordan let's see i have you missed the first week because you didn't you know start um how many days the first week did you come jordan uh two and then when i talked to the uh count like the office about it they don't start counting absences if you're not in the class so right those don't count on the okay. record good okay so those don't count so you only missed two the first two yeah but i didn't miss any so it's not counting right. as great and you and they don't count so i have you as here every day okay okay and then colin is meeting with me after class and then Aaron really needs to meet with me with a plan. Um, so if he wants to wait till I'm done with Colin or email me about when you want to meet. So, um, all right. Um, again, as I always say, I hope you take this seriously. <laughs> it really is important. Um, it's easy to sort of blow it off because, you know, it's not right in front of your face. But that's why reading history is important, because when you read history, you can read about countries where they lose their democracy, just drip, drip, drip a little bit at a time. And all of a sudden, oh, somebody wakes up and it's gone. That's what happened to Athens. Nobody thought they would ever lose it because it was so great. Right? It was so well structured. It was so beautiful. Yeah. It could happen to anybody. That's. And maybe I'm an old lady and I'm scared, but I think it could happen here. Um, okay, take care. Bye bye. I have a question. Okay. So, for the second essay, when was that due? It was due last, um, well, let's see, it was due last second, week, right? Second essay? I thought the first one was due last week. 